Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Andrea Carcano. I'm the co-founder and uh, CPO in uh, Adnazami Networks. And uh, today I have a special guest and I'm very excited to have the possibility to discuss today about, you know, OT cybersecurity in specific in the oil and gas industry and energy. And uh, I have uh, Jim Gwynn today with me. So, Jim, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Um, I am uh, Jim Gwynn, as, as Andreas said, and I am responsible for our hydrocarbons and energy utilities business for Accenture and trying to help uh, companies and organizations better secure it. So I'm, I'm really excited about having this, you know, this conversation and hopefully we get some good feedback. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Thank you, Jim. Very exciting also for me to have the chance to um, talk with you today. Um, I think we met roughly, you know, three, four years ago. And um, and I think uh, one of the things that I was all, always, and I was very uh, fascinated at the beginning when I met you, was your deep experience on the oil and gas industry. Is of course, the same industry where I grew up after my PhD. But of course, you know, talking with you, uh, you know, I was uh, very interested to know more about your deep experience that you had in the industry. And I think it would be great if you can tell us more, a little bit more about your story and your experience about, about the, this vertical. Yeah, well, so um, for those that don't know, I, I, I'm not a consultant by, um, for my entire career. I actually, my career started working offshore and in the field, looking for exploring and bringing to market hydrocarbons. So um, I have no PhD, so your pedigree is much better than mine. Um, you know, I spent I spent the vast majority of my career uh, trying to figure out how to uh, safely extract hydrocarbons and bring them to market. So, you know, over the course of the, you know, arguably 29 years of doing this, uh, have been to some of the most beautiful places in the world and most inhospitable places because Mother Nature doesn't put hydrocarbons in, in the most beautiful countries in the world. So uh, I've spent a good bit of time uh, living in the field and working in the field, and that's really what... Uh, what kind of shape my opinions about securing these assets? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's uh, that's great. And uh, you know, you mentioned you've been in uh, in very beautiful place. You mean in, you've been in place that they were not as 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 beautiful. So, do you have any an interesting story, or or can you share more about you know some of the places that you've been and uh, and uh, what was your um, main challenges when you were tackling this project in in different locations all over the world? Yeah, you know, um, I, I can give you two very interesting, what I consider to be interesting um, experiences. Um, one, uh, very early in my career, we were doing work for CNOC in China uh, years and years and years ago. And what you learn very quickly in China is if you find the person with the keys to open whatever it is you're trying to do, you never let that person leave because it is a very slow moving pace. And you know, the, the answer would always be, well, I don't have the keys, I can't open that closet, or I don't have the keys, I can't open that facility. And so when you found the person that could actually open the facility so you could do your work, you, uh, you hung on to them, right, so that you could try to get your job done and, and get home. Um, the other a bit more, um, uh, you know, difficult was my very first trip to Nigeria um, many, many years ago. Uh, we were doing work for one of the super majors, and we were going to be staying on their compound um, while we were doing the work. And uh, unfortunately, it was during a time of distant, and there was a group of individuals that had tried to overthrow the government. And one of the mandates at the time was anyone coming in, expat or otherwise, had to go by town square and see the repercussions of what that meant. And it was uh, it's something that you just you 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 don't want to you can't unsee it, but you definitely don't want to live it. So. Um, but uh, by the same token, you know, some of the trips back, I'd get to go to places like Rome and I'd get to stay, you know, in Vatican City and look around and, and see some of the beautiful things in the world. So it's not just the bad side. It's also the good side whenever you're, you're making your trip back home. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And one of the things that, as I was mentioning at the beginning, you know, when we, we get we, we we met each other, I told was. Uh, um, something that I really like about uh, the entire uh, team that you created um, in a center where you are right now and the philosophy and the culture that there is behind 
I think everything, everything was starting from a key point from my perspective. Like I've been on the other side. I know what a customer is looking for. And I'm not here to, you know, try to sell an extra things that the customer doesn't really need, but I really want to help the customer in, uh, in, in the problem that you have at that moment. So that's just something that I really like. And I want to ask you, Jim, uh, how much was important in your experience in what you're doing right now being on being on the other side of the house, be being on the customer side and leaving the problem that right now our customer are living in the day by day. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question. And you know, the the cybersecurity world that we live in today, you know, dated back 10, 15, even 20 years ago, um, before it was actually called cybersecurity, it was information technology security or whatever the whatever the phrase was at the time. The the challenge is that I saw, you know, we, we spent a lot of time operating systems and environments and applications, uh, and they're most, they were mostly, you know, uh, petrochemical systems or geophysical systems, and they weren't really like ERP or email or, you know, other sorts of applications that you would consider to be enterprise. And when, when new security programs or protocols or technologies started to emerge, the operational assets themselves were always left behind. And, and I, it, wasn't, it wasn't because people didn't believe they needed to be secured for the most part, or people didn't want them to be secured for the most part. It's that they were kind of out of sight, out of mind. And you know, from your own experience and how you, you know, grew up, you found that you'd have these really interesting solutions around securing assets, but the assets were enterprise IT assets, not field level OT assets. And so when, when my career pivoted from working in industry as a, uh, as a, uh, a buyer of services to someone that said, you know what, I'd really like to change the way that people are thinking about this. The, the major thing that I tried to focus on was OT security, operational technology security, right? Everything from HMIs to you know, RTUs to things that, you know, increase volumetrics on a, on a pipeline. And because those were the most vulnerable, they, 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 no one really knew. And when they went from serial based connections to different telemetries to IP based connections, people really didn't understand the potential impact. So we, you know, we've, we, the team that we've been able to amass uh, here uh, at Accenture, really their, their whole purpose in life is to try to focus on securing those assets. So we don't have an EHS or HSE issue because someone did something malicious to a particular uh, asset in the field. So our you know, pivot from IT enterprise security into true enterprise cybersecurity has been a great journey, right? Now I would even pivot and ask you the same question. Why, why in the world would you give up what you had from where you came from, which is a very rich company, a very rich culture, have some very innovative ideas to shift and start thinking about security in a different paradigm and, and make the personal investment and commitment to build something like the zone. Yeah, that's um, absolutely, Jim. And I think, uh, you know, everything you say, you know, resonate a lot on what I did and what is my experience. I think uh, that's his key. And uh, one of the things that I love about our partnership is that behind everything, there is this, this culture. Culture that, as you mentioned, is coming from understanding. What is the real problem? Not just trying to do something because we're not driven about making money. We're driven about helping. You know, we're driven about solving a real problem. That's just the main motivation behind behind that. And that's just coming from, as you mentioned, also from my experience, right? I I started from an academic uh, academic uh, perspective. So I did a PhD. So I was working in a laboratory where there was equipment like a PLC or an HMI, but it was still a laboratory. And my goal was building malware and virus, collaborating with the government, uh, attacking industrial control system, and, uh, and then I move on the defensive side. So it was a fantastic experience. Um, but one of the key parts of my experience was that at some point I have the chance to collaborate with a big uh, oil and gas company. And I joined the security, oper so they saw the security operations center team. And uh, that was a great experience. First of all, because when I joined, the team was very small, and and I grow, I help my uh, boss at that time to grow to grow the team uh, on the SOC Center, but also have the possibility to be in some of the places that you mentioned before. 
I was in Nigeria, I was in Congo, I was in Egypt, Tunisia. So I spend a lot of time in, uh, you know, in a pipeline, uh, reefs in the middle of the ocean, offshore platform, and so on. And uh, I've been completely honest, you know, at the beginning, I clearly have a good, you know, uh, some important stuff to learn because one thing has been in a laboratory and believe, you know, everything's from a paper perspective. The different things is when someone asks you to be in a pipeline in the middle of the desert in Tunisia and, uh, and now you're there and you stay there for three weeks and living with people that are there all year. And the, the closest, uh, you know, um, city is two hours driving in the desert from where the pipeline is. So. Uh, but that uh, was a fantastic journey and, and, and gave me the perspective of understanding exactly what was the needs uh, outside from the thero theoretical, uh, you know, aside from the theory behind cybersecurity applied for, for OT. But that was, that was the real problem, right? There was gas pumped from North Africa up to Europe. And, uh, you know, it was important that that platform was, uh, that the pipeline was working you know, 24 by seven. And um, and we have, you know, normal issue like, hey, do we have an asset inventory of what we have here? And uh, the best that I could get was some old piece of paper with, you know, some information about the asset, but but not as as we were used to in, in the IT side. So that is where, uh, you know, I really, as you mentioned, start to think about, I would like to do something different. and. Every consultant that were coming on board for helping us from the cybersecurity perspective, they were just coming with an idea like, I know everything's about cybersecurity, so I know how to help you. And for me, that was not true because it was there, you know, with, with my team living the problem. And I see there was, there was a, you know, a missing perspective in the picture. Yes, there was a fantastic experience on the, on the IT side, but you know, there was the assumption that more or less everything could be applied on the OT and, and it was not the case. Also because the level of, you know, cybersecurity that we have at that time was not as sophisticated as today, there was less maturity. So and that is basically what really convinced me to say, okay, I think I can do something. I think uh, I can put together what I learned from the academic perspective, what I learned on the field and try to create a solution that is there remembering that what we're trying to solve is a, is a similar problem to the IT, but has some very different characteristic. So, yeah, yeah that was... Uh, it's definitely, look, it's definitely different. And, and what I mean by different, um, everyone, everyone that's, you know, listening and on the call and that works in this industry knows that it doesn't matter whether it's a pipeline, whether it's an FPSO unit, whether it's a platform or a refinery, whatever it is, right? It can be a power gym facility, whatever it actually is. Its mission is uptime, it's resilience. That's what its mission is. It's to deliver that good to market in the most secure manner possible. It's not necessarily what you would sit, you know, what you would typically see in the IT realm of, oh, we've got a vulnerability, let's go ahead and patch it. You, you really, you can't do those things in an operationally sound environment because you have to test it. You have to soak it, right? You have to, you have to look at your, your order of operation. If I do this, what's the impact downstream? And is that going to disrupt or impact? Or, or are we going to create a shut-in, right? And, and then we can't move product. So it's a different mindset. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm immensely proud of what um, Accenture has been able to do and make investments in, and I'm not, I'm not preaching, because there's other companies that do a great job too, I'm, not, I'm just talking about my own experience, is the investment to truly understand, to truly understand the, the needs of the industry and build uh, solutions and teams and, and strategies to help companies with the industry lens, much like what you learned, what you, you know, what you articulated, right? You had the academic experience, you had the understanding, but then, to make it applicable for an industry that has really complicated and quite frankly, um, um, health, human and safety potential impacts if you do something incorrect. It really raises the stakes. I actually had, had a client, uh, he's since retired uh, and it, it doesn't matter who, uh, what company it is with, but it's, it's with a very well-known global organization. And, and we, were, we were sitting there and we were having uh, it was after dinner, we were having a cocktail with our families, our wives, and it was a, 
interesting discussion. And he said, he said, you know, the reality is I'm not really worried if SAP goes down. Yes, it will cause us some production hiccups. So I'm not really worried about that. What I'm worried about is losing a facility, or losing operation control of an asset. And if that happens, and I, I, I can paraphrase what he said, if that happens, the industry as we know it will change and we as a company may no longer exist because it could have been prevented. And they're looking at you know, the headlines from other industries, whether it's you know, credit agencies that lost you know, PII data or they're looking at it from um, you know, retail big box stores that lost credit card information and the financial impact that that had. He was astute enough to realize that the IT assets, although extremely important to the business operation, if they lose an OT asset, if they have a loss of control issue at an OT asset, they can literally um, have loss of human life or an environmental issue that is going to be extremely hard to recover from. And I thought that was one of the, and, and I thought that was one of the most astute. This is an individual that I've known for years. And I thought that being in his role in the organization that he was, you know, that he was working for, I thought that was an amazing perspective because as a business executive, you just don't hear that very often. So his, what we have seen in the transformation from when I started my career, when you started your career, actually as we've come together as an alliance and work together, is a pivot from not a conversation about if it can happen, but a conversation about what will happen if it occurs, right? And so it's a different, it's a different sort of gravity when you have those sorts of discussions. And it's actually quite refreshing. I would love for you and I to both be unemployed. And what I mean by that is there are no more cyber events anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. I think it's gonna occur, right? No, yeah, I, I would love the same. And I think you, you touched on one point that was key, right? I mean, uh, we partner partnership together on, on the cybersecurity space with, of course, your firm and my firm. And I think one of the, of the question that I had in mind, and you already partially, partially answered was, how would you characterize you know, the state of the cybersecurity in industry today? And in general, you already mentioned a little bit about the evolution. Um, starting from, you know, I can talk about 10 years ago, and I think you can go even back on time. How much do you think accelerate in the last three, four years, the maturity around the type of question that a customer is asking about the, the knowledge uh, of, uh, of the topic itself. Uh, do you think we are in a good shape? And what is your vision about, you know, the next uh, few months and years? Yeah, it's a, a fantastic question and I will answer it um, pre-COVID and COVID, right? There's two ways to what I believe is answer the question. One is in the, in the pre-COVID period of time, I saw immense progress with um, organizations that were very mature on the enterprise security side pivot and start making substantial investments in cybersecurity. And I thought that was amazing. I thought, and it wasn't us trying to move the market, it was us adapting to how the market was moving. And I thought, I thought some of the strides and some of the uh, investments, both in people and technology and governance programs, level was at one of the highest levels I've ever seen it, especially in the in the OT space. Comes COVID and the day the world stood still and we had negative oil prices, there was a big dramatic drop off, right? And and we all know as, as business professionals, you can only afford to do what you can literally afford to do, right? Yeah. Budgets are not endless. There you have to measure things based on risk and probability and weigh them out. You might have, you know, 20 or 30 most critical assets that, you know, something like CFAT applies to that you need to make sure don't have some sort of regulatory or environmental issue. Um, but then there are other assets that are less important. And I, I know that's a hard thing to say, but truly, as someone that worked in the field, there are assets that are less important. So post-COVID and post-negative oil, we've seen a shift in clients saying, I can no longer afford to continue down this journey. I need to pair this back to my most critical, critical assets. And I need to have an outcome-based solution. And I'm using words that, that I typically use. I can't just afford to pay people to go do something, to implement something and hope that it works. I need someone to be in the game with me that is gonna guarantee an outcome for the most critical assets that I have because my, my 
my budget has been cut dramatically. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add this to the mix. We have a, a fantastic threat intelligence group that we acquired uh, iDefense um, a few years ago, and they pay attention to the really, really dark places on the internet and the really, really bad things that are happening. And as of May, and it's only increased since then, due to COVID, right? There, there's, a, there's a saying in the, in the US, it was by a US politician a while back, and, and he said, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, threat actors are absolutely perfect at that. They never let a good crisis go to waste. And so we, we have seen, you know, pre-COVID really impactful investments made by everyone from power generation to midstream operators to explorers to uh, producers of petrochem industrial products really make significant investments in their OT endeavors. But then they had to truncate the budget or shrink the budget because they just didn't have the operating capital to continue. And then we had threat actors really start to increase. In fact, per the, the reference that I made about our, our threat intelligence team, back in May, there were over 6,000 new uh, domain names that were popping up that we know were associated to malicious actors because of third party groups that were managing them or communicating with them that had some sort of URL related to domain name related to COVID. And, and what they were doing was they were taking advantage of the bad situation with COVID to try to launch phishing campaigns in a targeted sense against, you know, uh, energy companies, oil and gas companies, even healthcare companies, quite frankly, most recently, to yeah. try to steal and harvest IP or do something really malicious. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible storm to be in where your budget drops dramatically and the cyber attacks increase dramatically and you have no way to try to mitigate that other than just risk rank your assets and only try to support those that are most critical to the business operations, right? From, from a health, human and safety environment. Absolutely, I agree completely. This trend that you just mentioned is a trend also that without our, our, our threat intelligence groups inside Nozomi, we absolutely observed. And uh, I mean, I grew up in that community and I think you mentioned something that is absolutely critical. When a disruptive event happens, especially when there is a crisis or something like that, hacking community is always ready to, to use that, that specific topic for, uh, you know, uh, perform different type of attack or use that topic to increase certain type of attack. We saw uh, botnet growing and, uh, you know, and I think, uh, uh, for sure, some of the reason was that they had the possibility to perform more attack using COVID topic. And right now, one of the latest things that we are observing is also that the vaccine topic, right, has become another topic that is well used for, uh, you know, attract and make sure that because the topic is hot, maybe people pay less attention and, and ended up to be more attackable in a certain perspective. And another thing that we saw that I completely agree with you is the fact that the land, landscape changed, right? And we had company that they were like, okay, I still prefer having my people go on site and managing everything's on site. And then even if they didn't want, they have to put in place an infrastructure or leverage an infrastructure that was already in place to start to allow more connection coming from remote, allow more action uh, performed from remote instead of site. It's clearly depending about the industry and where you are in the process. But for sure, we saw also an increase of that, that, you know, even if you don't want, is at least the, um, the threat that, that you are exposed in the company are just growing simply because now you are, you are, you know, opening up a little bit more. So, and as you mentioned on the other side, um, especially on, in the oil and gas sector, you, you basically see in some cases the budget shrink, and now you really need to uh, provide new functionality you have the attack growing and the budget is, uh, is lowering. So, Jim, on this topic, I think uh, I get a few messages when, when we start to advertise on, on uh, public, on, on the social, on Twitter, Instagram, and so on, and LinkedIn, that we are going to have the discussion together. So I have a few CISO and, uh, and executive in the cybersecurity industry that they text me and they will be, you know, uh, they are probably live with us or they will listen to us on, on the podcast. So, but um, considering that we have, uh, you know, many, many people with an executive role right now listening to us, 
So I know that is a question that can have a very uh, broad answer, but my question for you is, what do you think um, should be, you know, the main three aspect or the main aspect that, you know, if you are a CISO today and you're managing a, a, a big oil and gas company from the cybersecurity perspective, what do you think, you know, the people that are listening to us should be focused on? How do you think you would approach the problem considering all the factors that we see, COVID, low budget, and uh, a new type of attacks and scenarios? Yeah, it's um, fantastic question. The, my, um, the way that I try to approach it and when we talk with our clients or even our peers or even our competitors, right? Because, you know, there's, this is a very small, um, in the realm of cybersecurity, this subset that focuses on process control networks, ICS systems, OT assets is even a subset that's smaller. And, and what, what, I try to, what I try to instill is you can't go conquer everything. There's no way you can go conquer everything. So what are your most critical assets? What are your most risky geographic regions that you operate in? Where do you see your threat intelligence giving you indicators that there is a heightened sense of activity in the cyber world and then focus your dollars there. And I would even take it to the point of, you know, for CISOs uh, and CSOs that are reporting out to the board, I would literally have those risk-based conversations with the board members and with the CEO and with the CFO and CO because they're, they definitely understand if you if you take the time to do the risk analysis and identify where the risks are coming from, and it's real, they do exist, but where can you make the biggest impact to reduce the overall portfolio of risk that an organization has? That's what I would recommend to CISOs and CSOs alike is focus the limited budget and time that you have on your most critical assets that have the highest risk and potentially highest probability of some vulnerability. That can come in the form of mergers and acquisitions. That can come in the form of, I mean, it, it happens all the time, right? Even, even we do it, um, uh, Nozomi does it, right? When, when a client, you know, we like to have good marketing and be able to share the good things that we're doing. Um, well, the same thing, companies, if they buy a particular device, and I, it doesn't matter who it is, right? It could be ABB, Siemens, Yokogawa, whoever, Generally, someone puts a press release out about that particular thing in that turnaround or that geographic region or that divestiture or that acquisition they're doing. Anytime stuff like that hits the media, if a CISO can be in the interfold of knowing that pre-announcement, they can up their, up their awareness and they can start to do a little bit more uh, through their CSOC or through their SOC operations um, alerting around domain names for a target acquisition or environments, you know, in a geographic region so that they might be able to see uh, a threat coming at them as announcements are made. So being very in line with the business and the direction the business is going and knowing if the business is doing a divestiture, an acquisition, a merger, or acquiring a lot, you know, call it a quarter billion dollars of new gear for a turnaround, being embedded with the business and knowing that ahead of time, you can start to turn things on and pay attention closer so that if somebody uses that intelligence that you put out into the market as something that they're going to use as a potential input for a targeted attack, you might be able to detect it quicker. And, and spending your dollars in those ways, the limited dollars that a CISO has, I think would be very valuable. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and, you, and you mentioned on another key point that I really liked about the fact that be embedded in the business process, right? And one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing is uh, there is also an evolution uh, on the network, uh, on the way that, you know, on the type of components that we see on what we define OT networks. I think uh, if you look at the amount of what, what is defined today is uh, IoT components, that they are part of, uh, of an OT network today and how many we had 10 years ago, we have a very, you know, very deep different amounts. So my feeling is that, you know, some of these networks are a little bit changing the shape. And my question for you, Jim, is do you have the same experience? So do you, are you seeing an evolution 
um, from from the network perspective? And do you see now a much a, mu a much higher combination of classical OT components with what we define today more IoT components? Whatever they do, right? It can be a VoIP phone, can be providing physical security, a camera, can be even a badge access control. I was by the way, talking with a customer and they said, oh, we just put the new badge access control is everything's connected with the IP address now and they can get in real time data. Perfect. Now is an IoT component part of your network. And uh, so my question for you is, uh, uh, are you seeing this evolution happening? And how do you think um, uh, the customer that are facing these on top of the embedded, as you already mentioned, in, in this evolution, how do you think they should approach this this change of scenario? Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, the, looking back in history, the reason that a lot of these assets went to IP base is is for automation. It's for it's for taking the human out of the field and being able to control more things remotely. Right. It's it's just for automation. And in automation, you get efficiencies and you get you get uh, increased operational. Uh, insight into those particular assets. That's all goodness. Every bit of that is goodness. However, every time you attach a new asset to um, uh, the network uh, and, and you start to pull it into a central hub or a central location, you increase the pathways and the attack surfaces that a cyber threat actor could could go after an organization, right? And And what we see in in what the trends, you know, oil and gas, as an example, has been an innovator and a leader in technology evolution. You know, looking back at, you know, the words of big data, right? When I when I was still in the industry, we were dealing with data volumes that were petabytes in size for subsurface geophysical exploration. So, you know, big data was, you know, originated in in what you would consider to be oil and gas, and 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 that also deals with things like. Uh, down, way downstream, way, way downstream, like power distribution, bulk energy systems, transmission systems. The amount of data that you use has to be consumed by something, and that means some sort of an, an asset needs to use it. So we're going to see this evolution of more and more devices, whether it's on your iPad or your computer or your, your, your phone. You're going to start to see more connectivity so that you can get to the information quicker, which is good for automation but it is potentially bad for cyber threat vulnerabilities. And, and if we look at, you know, I see you wearing your smartwatch, right? I still use an analog watch because it's really hard to break into it. But, but you know, it, as, as these, as these um, technologies, these IoT and even IoT devices become more prevalent, we just increase the potential attack surface that a bad actor can use. So, we have to figure out very rapidly how do we embed our security programs, process, and procedure in those assets because they're coming, right? I mean, SCADA systems in the cloud, they're coming, right? Operational assets in the cloud and data volumes coming in from the field, it's here. So we just have to figure out how to be ahead of it, how to be mindful of it, and how to embrace them uh, because they're coming. Our, our, biz, our lines of business are going to acquire them. We have to figure out how to secure them and enable that business to use them in the most appropriate way. I, I agree. I agree completely. And you touch a point that I feel very attached to that you mentioned, you know, the cloud, because I think we started in a, in a world where, you know, cloud was absolutely um, not the good things to do. And, uh, and probably at that time was the right reason. And um, but I think now there is an evolution. So now you mentioned a keywords that is cloud. So um, do you see the cloud starting to playing an important role uh, inside, you know, the let me say OT cybersecurity industry? So do you think that who is sending us should start to consider to embrace the cloud? And and if yes, for according to you, what, which are the main reasons why it's important to start to do that? Yeah, I, for sure. I can tell you, and I have no problem. There may be, you know, clients of mine that are on the call listening. Um, 10, 12 years ago, I said, don't put this stuff in the cloud. Don't do it, right? Because it's not quite there yet. Today, I'm absolutely saying get ahead of it and do it. And do it for two reasons. Number one, the cost of infrastructure is so immense today. Data centers, ping power and pipe, raised floors, all of that. It's just so immense 
to be able to uh, have to embark on building those facilities, leverage the cloud because it is much more cost effective. And number two, in the world we live in today, the big cloud players, right, have learned from one another and they have learned from the continuous attacks that they have gotten because they're a plethora of data. They're, you know, if you could break into any one of the big players, any one of the mags, right, if you could break into any one of them, you could arguably have access to endless supplies of, of information, but they've gotten extremely good at cybersecurity, extremely good because they've had to. So my position is, you know, it could be a SCADA system, it could be a PCN system, it could be pulling your, your production data into the cloud to do something useful with it, um, to be able to predict, you know, your, your reservoir, or your models uh, in, in some meaningful way, is embrace it as quickly as you can and migrate as fast as you can so that you can reduce cost and you can invest the limited dollars you have to securing it and better uh, enabling the business to operate uh, as opposed to building infrastructure that you really don't need anymore. Like I said, my career is, you know, I'm, I'm of a different vintage. So back then it was about building data centers and installing applications and, you know, having the fastest, you know, T1 and T3 lines to be able to communicate with the field and move data. It's not about that. It's about yeah. enabling business in the most secure manner possible. And, and, you know, even with our cloud first initiative, it is extremely imperative to have our security professionals, especially in the OT realm, figure out how to secure those uh, legacy OT assets for cloud enablement. Absolutely, I, yes. I completely, completely on board on what you said, and uh, in, in in particular, you know, is something that I I start to believe a few years ago, and I know there will be people listening to us that they say, what, Andrea, you told me for five years ago, you were telling me cloud, absolutely not, exactly as you mentioned, Jim. But I, I agree with you, stuff change. I think in the, for example, in Anzami, in the last two years, we work and we had just announced in, in October, uh, Vantage that is our SaaS cloud offering. And, uh, but that's just because, you know, aside from the solution and aside what is the company, right? Now talking about the community, Talking, forgetting, you know, the solution on the Zami itself. I agree with you. I think right now we reach a, uh, um, a stage of maturity where, it, yes, by sending data on the cloud, you, you open up to potential new threat. This is okay. That's are there. I'm not, we're not saying that our, there is no potential to new threat. But the, the net that balance about, you know, the goal, as we say here, is reducing the risk. That is our mission. That is what we need to do dreaming one day to bring the risk to zero. And then, as you mentioned, maybe we'll be unemployed. But it would be, be a better word, right? So, but if you look at that risk, if you see the data flowing on the cloud, now you have so much more capability in terms of saving costs. You can use that money in a different way. Scalability, you can scale much faster. Um, even for the cybersecurity perspective, when you are on the cloud, you have a CPU capability and a power that you can really manage that data in a different level and you can provide a better visibility to the customer so more actionable information so and, and, and much other benefits right so overall i think that by embracing as far as fast as possible the cloud and uh, and bringing data up on the cloud i think our customer can at the end of the day looking at the cybersecurity perspective reducing the risk not increasing the risk and uh, and i think we're there so yeah absolutely think that that's the way to go yeah, I completely agree. I, you know, um, I recently, within the past six months, did a um, a presentation. It was part of the audit committee to the board of, of a well-known, you know, public company. And the question came from uh, one of their board members, do we need to start thinking about the cloud in a different way? Um, and and the individual, you know, I, I, I jokingly talk about my my vintage. This individual was of, of even more seasoned vintage, a little bit older than, than me. Um, and, and the awareness that the individual had about the need for cloud and their willingness to say, do we need to consider to have our production operations in the cloud was um, really somewhat refreshing. And when I say refreshing, it's because they, they had been educated by their senior leadership in technology and operations that this is something they need to consider and they are starting to educate themselves and they had a third party, i.e. me, come and talk about it and security 
of moving things like, you know, their their SCADA system in the cloud. And what would that really mean? And and the way that I described it was, you know, there's 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 a handful, not many, a handful of smaller operators that are doing that today. And and a lot of it has to do with the technology and whether or not you can use it in a cloud environment. Um, but I said, it's coming. So let's get ahead of it. We know it's coming. So if we know it's coming, how do we get ahead of it? And how do we actually work better to secure? It, right. That's if you just you just have to embrace it. Technology is going to change. I, I, I'll tell you a stupid story. Years and years ago, you know, you used to have the old nine track tape drives, right, that you'd store data on. And, you know, it was all binary. It was A0, A1, A2, A3, B0, B1. And so you had these nine track tape drives. And, and I remember when eight millimeter tapes came out that could store literally a gigabyte of data, right? This was like 940K. This was a gigabyte of data. And I was talking with one of my peers at the time, and we were very early in our career. And he was like, I don't think these things will ever work. And I said, look, here's the deal. You better embrace it because it's coming. If somebody spent the time to figure out how to block the data small enough to get it onto this device, it's going to be even smaller by the time our career ends. So that's what I say about cloud. The evolution is here. The technology is here. We need to figure out and we need to work with the other vendors, you know, the, the, the uh, SCADA vendors, the operational asset vendors, and figure out how to do this in a secure manner. I don't really care whose it is or whose cloud it is or whose technology it is. I, I'm, I've given up on technology wars a long time ago. I care more about the securing of the asset because it's going to come. And if we don't prepare for it, then we're going to be caught. We're going to be caught on our heels and have to try to figure it out and, and probably make some mistakes along the way. I agree. I agree. Um, I think uh, and I think it, the great news is that I, I already seen, you know, some of our common customer and uh, another customer all over the world that some of them are already there embracing. Some of them are thinking about that. And I see some of the question coming. I think we really touched a topic for many of the people that are listening to us today. So. Now we're almost approaching the end, and I think uh, in specific uh, we the last topic uh, I saw created lots of attention. Now there is a bunch of questions, but let me let me pick one that I think uh, can be um, sweet and fast. And uh, one question is um, based on your international experience. So and I think we have a, a quite uh, you know a crew of people coming from all over the world listening to us today, or they will listen to this pod podcast. Um, do you think differences? Do you think there is differences in the way that the cybersecurity have to be approached in different parts of the world? I know it's a very big and, and broad question, but uh, something that you can share about, you know, differences that you see in something that is done in the United States versus in other parts of the world um, in level of security, whatever you can share, I think was a, an interesting topic that came out in some of the questions. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, I, I don't want to answer it in two ways, but I'll say one, some geographies in some countries are much more mature in their awareness of security. And some are so vast in size that to get your arms around what a nation state oil and gas company or utility um, might do is different than, you know, what you might consider as a uh, U.S. domestic onshore player, right? Because just the, the vastness of it, is just the size and scale is, is different. What I will say is if everybody could do one thing and one thing and do it, you know, get an A-plus rating in doing it, if you can take the human condition out of the equation, you will become much more cyber resilient. Even still today, and this is not just Accenture's own data and our own research, this is broadly anybody. You can get it from anywhere. The single, the single um, uh, largest, the largest way that the, the most uh, impactful way that people, bad actors, still get into organizations is by phishing campaigns and people clicking on things they shouldn't in emails and other. So if regardless, you could be working in the Middle East, you could be working in Southeast Asia, you could be working, you know, um, in you know the Permian Basin, it doesn't really matter. If you can eliminate the human condition of people doing things that they shouldn't, right? Enabling web servers on devices that shouldn't need them or uh, clicking on emails that you don't know whether or not they're coming from a trusted source, you would see the cyber risk drop dramatically, right? Because 
Phishing is still the absolute number one way yeah. that organizations get breached. Period. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's still the easiest way is if you're an hacker and is the is the way that is uh, you can really drop the risk by investing on, on that part. That's an important factor. So I, I would love to keep asking questions, Jim, for, for all day, but I think we're almost at the end of, uh, of our time. But, you know, let me let me ask you just a, a final question. And my final question is looking at the future, right? Assuming you can have a crystal ball and, you, you know, you can predict a little bit the future. What do you what do you expect? I think we already talked a little bit about the cloud, but I'm curious to have you know a final comment, you know, putting together all your years of experience about you know what we really have ahead of us and how is your feeling in general about the level that we reach in cybersecurity? Because as we say, at the end of the day, we have one mission and we're trying to make, you know, to reduce the risk and to make this, this world a little bit more secure. So what's your feeling there? And your um two things. One open collaboration uh, and, and what I mean what I mean by that is there are there are organizations and business relationships and people that I would consider to be friends that when we know something bad is happening we don't try to create a commercial event out of it we go notify people we go share the information because if we can do that you know there's there's a lot of organizations that try to keep everything very close and say I know something, would you like to know it? And then I, I, I'm not a fan of that. Yes, we are a commercial enterprise. Yes, we have shareholders. Yes, we are here to help companies and we charge for doing that. But in times of need, everybody working together in the future is going to make things a lot better for us all. Number two, and this is really the one that I've lived my career around is, you know, at the very beginning of my career, we were buying new technology and new systems and new uh, hardware and software to be able to do exploration and and it was on the precipice of 4D reservoir modeling and and a lot of the uh, developers that I worked with and a lot of the operators I worked with they didn't want to learn this new technology because it was too complicated it was unstable it was not it just wasn't it, they just didn't like it. and and one of the gentlemen I worked with uh, who's probably long since retired he said if you can always gravitate towards the newest things and figure out how to use them and use them effectively, your career will never become stagnant. And so in the application for security, one, I just talked about information sharing. When we know something bad is happening, getting it out in the public domain as quickly as possible to limit risk, that's one. Number two is everyone on this call and anyone that we come in contact with, as we've talked about you know, operational systems in the cloud and we've talked about you know, technology enhancements with IoT and IoT, embrace it as quickly as possible, right? It may not always work, or it may take a year or two or three years for the technology to catch up to what we need it to do to be really effective, but embrace it very quickly. And when you do embrace it, look at it with an operational asset owner's mindset and look at it from a cyber resilience perspective, and you can figure out how to make it work in a better way. So those are the two things that I would say broadly share information and absolutely look at the technology that's coming out and assess it very quickly to figure out how you can better enable the business. Yeah, that is uh, is fantastic, Jim. I think, uh, you know, the two final keyword, you know, community, so sharing and, and embracing. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And and uh, let me say, talking with you is always refreshing. So and from a cultural perspective, I feel aligned and always optimistic because at the end of the day, aside from the company where we're working for, I always feel that we are, you know, as you mentioned, uh, try to achieve the same mission um, and we have the same goal. So that's it's great. And I hope uh, everyone that is listening to us enjoy that. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to uh, chat with you soon. And uh, for who is following us on the webinar, um, here you can see a page with some of the resources that we just mentioned. Um, you know, we, we mentioned about sharing. So case study, web page with tools, um, the cyber range that 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 us uh, that our central security put in place, blog, web page. So that is all contents that are there to be used that we want to put, you know, there available for the community. So feel free to go there, use it, and uh, hopefully that that is useful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, my friend. Be safe and be well. We'll talk soon. Yeah.
Talk to you soon. Bye.